my screen. Okay. So hello everyone. Uh, thanks for coming. Today, I'm going to be talking a bit about uh, the Mellon project here at the University of Oregon. And before I get into uh, the meat of the presentation, I want to thank Emporia State for giving us this opportunity. I want to thank uh, the U of O for this opportunity. And I want to thank the Andrew Mellon Foundation for funding this whole initiative. It's been, uh, I think it's been fun. I think it's been a rewarding experience so far. So what, before we get into the project itself, I want to talk a bit about the project team. And this might help give you an idea of what sort of skills and what sort of backgrounds the people working on this project have had. So first, I'm going to talk about the project managers. The first project manager we had was Jenny Krieger, who had a doctorate in archaeology with a focus on Roman tombs and memorial sites in Sardinia. And she also had a bit of a data scientist lean. That's what she's doing right now. Our next manager was Ben Gillespie, who has a PhD in art history with a focus on. Uh, can I hide this? No. I, I don't think, well, actually, yes, I can. Perfect. He has a focus on 20th century activist arts. And he's currently at the Smithsonian. Our current manager is Franny Gade, who is a through and through librarian with a master's of. Uh, information science, and she's the head of the digital scholarship services here at the U of O. And on the GE end of things, we have uh, Liam Mayer last year, who was an MA student in the history of art and architecture. We had Aksa Khan, who was my coworker this year, who's pursuing an MS in public policy and management. And then there's myself, and I'm pursuing a master's in Asian studies. And so you can see there's sort of a um, there's not one background that went into this team. We, we have a variety of different skills that we could bring to the table here. And that's helpful for the way that this project worked. So the basic idea of uh, the Mellon Grant is to bring together two opposing collections. And that's the library and that's the museum. And this is not just about bringing together collections in the short term, this is also about expanding the accessibility of these collections in the long term and making use of new tools of scholarship and presentation for um, these collections. And so here at the O, we have the O Libraries and we have the Jordan Schnitzer Museum of Arts. And both of these uh, institutions have a great deal of collections that don't necessarily, you know, they're not well known about. They're off in um, special collections, they're off deep in the stacks, they're off in the museum vault. And part of the idea of this project was to rectify that, to bring them out in the open, to make use of digital scholarship tools. And so to that effect, we've had six projects to work on. Last year we had three, this year we also have three. And here's the basic rundown. We had David Frank's project on James Blue's 1963 documentary, The March. And we had, we had Dina Seam's project on the artful fabric of collecting, which made use of uh, the museum's ample Chinese textiles and had a particular focus on the actual world of art collection back in the turn of the 19th and 20th centuries. We had Glenn Wally's project on Nosatsu, or Japanese votive slips, which made use of a particularly, um, I guess, a, a unique resource here at the U of O. We have a very large collection of Nosatsu, the largest I've heard outside of Japan, actually. This year, we have a, uh, some different projects, including one that's um, more, it's more related to curricula than it is related to uh, necessarily presenting individual research. So we have Akiko Wally's project on Tekigami and Kyogire, which is making use of uh, calligraphy here at the UVO. Daphne Gallagher's project on collections in our contemporary times, making use of 
digital tools like Canvas and um, other presentation platforms. And we have Kristen Yars and Mary Woods project. And so they are focusing more on presenting a certain moment in the history of mental health in the United States and putting that into a podcast to reach a wider audience. And this podcast at some point is gonna be on Spotify. And so they're really hoping to get the word out as part outreach, part research. But as you can see, we have very different project priorities for all of these. And they all were supposed to be finished within the same academic year, rather than three and three. And so here's just a brief overview of what that looked like. So in 2018 to 2019, we had a we had more of a crunch schedule for David Frank's projects because we were hoping to have his done by Martin Luther King Day. And the March on Washington was if well, we're talking about the film right now. It was largely it was one of his biggest press ops, essentially. It was a very big moment for his public image. And so David Frank hopes to make this available for school teachers around the state of Oregon, around, around the West Coast, and around the entire country, and have a, an outreach program to that effect. And so we were really in a condensed schedule to get that done. Um, however, that wasn't the only thing we had to focus on. We also had to focus on planning and staging the Asim and Wally projects. And that was, some of that was at the GE level, some of that was figuring out what tools we could use, what tools we couldn't use. Well, a lot of that was up at the managerial level. In winter term, we had finished the front project. That was all mostly done by mid-December. And then after that, the Ina scene projects took priority. But it was, it was scheduled to be finished around March of that year, but the more we got into it, the more we realized that that wasn't feasible. And so it ended up actually being finished after the Wally project. But we started working on the Asim project, the intent to finish it before the Wally project. And we started the Wally project in the same term. Spring term was a very busy time. And it was mostly with, um, we were mostly occupied with site building, with data entry, and with resolving technical glitches at the Omeka sites. And at the same time, Jenny Krieger was also working on approving next year's Nolan Grant projects, which is a different layer of work for the manager. As for 2019, 2020, it's hard to say because we're not done yet. But here's a brief overview of how the workflow has gone. So in the fall term, we were working a lot on measurements, on data entry, and associated research for Akiko Wally's Takagami project. That was probably the largest uh, focus in fall term, and this continued through the winter term. But we also did research, and we did research into uh, some of the special collections archives on Morningside Hospital for the Aris Wood project, and we also did some. Uh, explorations into outreach methods for the mental health outreach aspect of the project. However, a lot of that was also on the managerial level, so I can't say too much about it. As for winter term, uh, the Takagami project continued and we finished up most of you know, the grunt work for that. So we finished up most of the measurements, or we finished up all the measurements rather. We finished the data entry, the associated research, and we sent it in to uh, Professor Wally, so that she could go through and check everything. Um, let's see, after that, we worked on transcripts of the Yaris project and started creating the projects with Kristen Yaris and Mary Wood. And the podcasts, we had a more ambitious schedule for the podcasts back at the start of this term, but that had to change with some um, new developments. And so our podcast goals are a bit less ambitious than they were in late winter term. At the same time, we also started looking into outreach strategies for the Gallagher Project. And spring term is ongoing, so there's not too much to say about it. We're continuing to work on the Yaris Wood Project. 
we're continuing to work on setting up sites for all of these. And we're continuing to work on identifying and annotating online resources for the museum studies and for the Gallagher project. But one thing to note is that uh, since our current or since our manager for 2019-2020, Ben Gillespie, had to leave early and due to disruptions related to COVID-19, we've actually had to extend our schedule into the summer term for this year. So this is not the whole picture. We'll see what summer has to bring. And it just goes to show that these projects can be somewhat, um, the scheduling can be difficult and it's not always necessarily smooth. But for now, I want to talk a bit about the everyday work that went into uh, these different stages of the Mellon project. I think this might be one of the more useful slides uh, for anyone considering doing a similar sort of project. Now, naturally, these were all different projects, and I'll get into a bit of the specifics of how they differed uh, in a bit. But for now, I just want to show you some of the different skills and the different tasks that were needed in everyday work for these. So for the David Frank project, there was a lot of research involved. Uh, there was a lot of writing and editing. There were videos that needed to be cut and, and clipped and captioned. Uh, there was data to be entered. And this was all going up on a blog, or rather a UO blogs uh, websites using WordPress. And this changed a couple of times. And so there was work to be done with maintaining the website and with promoting the website after that. For Professor Asim's project, we had more work with transcriptions than for the Frank project. There were lots of documents you wanted transcript or transcribed. There were documents in the special collections that hadn't been digitized yet that she wanted transcribed. And there were articles and all sorts of things to do. But there were also lots of odd tasks mixed in there. And for the Aki Kawali project, it was more, it was more a clear cut, I believe. I think we had a fairly, the first and most important task was selection. We had to go through uh, the museum database, we had to go through the the Oregon Digital Database and find what Professor Wally wanted to use for his websites. And so, oh, is it chat? Uh, yes, Franny's sharing some links with everyone. Thank you, Franny. And these are great projects. I, I do recommend checking them out just so you can get a taste of what can be done with this sort of, um, with this sort of setup and with a little bit of work or with a lot of bit of work, I should say. But there's a lot of benefits to, uh, to, to how these projects work, honestly. But we'll, we'll get into that in a bit. So for Glenn Wally, aside from selecting the Nosatsu he wanted to use, there was also research into the different symbols used, the subculture surrounding Nosatsu, and into the collector who provided the Nosatsu to the university. And obviously there was also a lot of grunt work with Photoshopping, with data entry, and with uh, creating the Omeka sites. For 2019 and 2020, uh, once again, it's not done yet, but so far, one of the biggest tasks for Aki Hawali's project was measurements and research into the associated um, sutra fragments, the calligraphy fragments, and into Tekagami. There's a lot of data entry, there was some translation work, but Aki Kawali took the mantle for that for the most part. But she had wanted to take more thorough notes in a specific way, and so we had to go through things that had already been measured at many points and remeasure them according to her specifications. As for the Gallagher projects, the biggest responsibility so far has been working on the sites, has been uh, working on the actual Canvas websites and how to do that properly, then reaching out to relevant institutions like museum associations and schools and whatnot to talk about curation and uh, how to present some of these university resources effectively. For Yaris Wood, uh, research was a big thing, but the, this is unique to the Yaris Wood project. Podcast creation has been probably the largest effort on the part of the Mellon team. 
And this meant gathering, you know, gathering the professors, gathering students, uh, professional voice actors who volunteered some time, uh, very kindly of them. And, you know, really trying to work on acting out and recreating some of these transcripts, trying to recreate some of the discussions that happened at Morningside Hospital. We've had to scale that back a bit, uh, but the work for creating these podcasts is still ongoing. And so is the work for the relevant uh, outreach program that will be associated with the launch of this project in the summer. And just to show you how we actually get it done, here is what the team looks like, just for some crystallization. We have a full-time project manager, currently Franny, uh, before it was Ben, and before that it was Jenny. For each project, there's a professor with leave for the term, so they can dedicate all of their working time to this project. Well, as much as they, oh, that I should add a provision to that, especially for the Asim project, since Professor Asim was very involved with administrative duties in the history departments. Even if the professor doesn't have class to teach that term, it's not necessarily that they have the term free. But effectively, a professor with time to work on this project, you have two graduate employees working for uh, 0.49 FTEs, and that's part of our graduate contracts. And so that means it has to be 19 hours under a week, but it's not a hard limit. It has to average out to 19 hours under a week. Some weeks, especially back during the Frank project, because we were working a condensed schedule, there were longer weeks. But the idea is that it's supposed to average out to 19 hours and under. And aside from that, it would be, you know, that we can't go without mentioning the digital services team, without the museum support team, without the data team, the library, without the students that the professors brought in to help work on the project. And I mean, there's all sorts of non-Mellon team members who are absolutely integral to the success of any of these projects. And this, that's something else to bear in mind. Now, for managing the team, the most useful tool was probably email, which is to be expected. We've also been using Microsoft Teams for SharePoint. Uh, SharePoint has been very key in ensuring that we all have access to the same documents, that we're all on the same page, that we're all able to uh, do our work efficiently and effectively, especially given the difficulties uh, lately. Having that sort of tool is very useful. Aside from that, regular meetings. Uh, we did more regular meetings in 2018 to 2019. In 2019 to 2020, we had more as needed meetings. And I would say that the, there isn't necessarily a pro or a con to either of them. It's just a different way of organizing and of uh, communicating. But it is something to note that you can results may vary with meetings. And another thing that I think was a challenge, at least last year of the project, was time tracking. And so Jenny Krieger had set up a sheet for us to use for time tracking, but for one, re one reason or another, uh, the time tracking sheet was sort of forgotten. And so our, our efforts to track the time was not entirely successful. But much, I think much more important than the time tracking sheet was the project management spreadsheet that she had set up. And that was this uh, three page spreadsheet with all of the tasks associated with the project uh, listed. And you know, decided, this is a Liam task, this is a Jenny task, this is a Tom task, this is an everyone task. And you would write updates into the sheet as you went along. And this was probably the most the most effective organizational tool that we had last year, I think. We didn't do it again this year, but we also saw a lot of each other. And so I don't think there was quite the same impetus to make it. Okay, so here I wanna get a bit more into the specifics of the projects. And so here we have a little bit of the March playing on this side. We can get a sense of what James Blue's film was like. And I already told you a bit about the tasks, but, um, you know, David Frank, he's a professor of rhetoric in the Honors College here at the U of O. And he's 
especially interested in 20th century America and with racial issues in 20th century America. And since James Blue was an alum of the University of Oregon, he thought that this would be a wonderful project to go along with an existing project by one of our prof uh, professors of the film department, uh, Richard Her uh, Herskowitz. And so this is building off of an existing project and existing resources particular to the U of O since he was alone. But it was supposed to connect to all sorts of things. It, you know, this involved LBJ, this involved the USIA, which is a propaganda agency back during the Cold War era. And I think it was only disbanded in the 90s. And so part of it was an attempt to connect this to today. And part of this was an attempt to just showcase a sort of a, a unique contribution from a UO alum. But we had a lot of challenges just due to the nature of this project. Uh, one of them, we won't get to this part in the film, so we'll move on before that. Is, uh, even in this film itself, which is government property and therefore public property, uh, you know, Martin Luther King Jr.'s speech is actually private property. It's the property of the King Estates. And so the audio had been redacted from it. And so even with this sort of, you know, this sort of central piece of the project, you don't have all the pieces that you actually would like to have, but you, you, you work around those things. More problematic, we didn't, we, this was the first project, and so we weren't necessarily clear on everything that needed to be done at the time. It was a lot of learning as we went along. And as we went along, we realized that we didn't necessarily have the proper usage rights for other things, like interviews with George Stevens Jr., who was the manager of the USIA at the time James Blue was hired, or other stuff like that, some of his colleagues, some of his professors. And there were lots of challenges involving usage rights that fall. Accessibility was also an issue. We realized that we need to get everything captioned, and that was a debate of whether it be easier to do that in-house or to hire an outside service. And key again is the condensed schedule of the fall project. But it was also, I think, a very, a very effective project. It touched upon lots of different areas of the film. It tried to strike a middle ground between an academic audience and a high school audience. Multiple, multiple groups were supposed to get use out of this. It was supposed to have a little bit of something for everyone. And I think it did succeed. I thought it was a very effective website. But we did have a problem with promoting the websites. And so we didn't necessarily get as many uh, hits as we would have liked for Martin Luther King Day that year. But the key tools that we used here, WordPress, uh, Holmes, which is a University of Kentucky um, resource. It's all about uh, hosting oral histories. And it allows you to caption them, to tag them, and host them. And it's a, it's a wonderful tool. And it was, I think, probably one of the things that made the project so effective is that we could contextualize these, um, these recorded interviews and these you know, telephone calls with LBJ and plug them right into our WordPress sites. For Professor Asim's project, which is Professor of History, uh, with a focus on traditional China. Uh, her big focus was on Gertrude Bass Warner and her collecting here. You know, Gertrude Bass Warner was the patroness of the JSMA. And she founded the museum based on her own personal collections. And it was supposed to be an Asian art museum to increase cultural communication for the goal of establishing world peace and mutual understanding. It was very idealistic. But it's also, it's a very fine ideal. And part of what Asim you know, wanted to capture was the personality of um, the sort of unique woman, but also how she actually got a hold of all of this stuff. And it has a lot to do with the dynastic collapse of the Qing dynasty. You know, eunuchs were selling everything in the palace because everything was coming crashing down. They didn't have anywhere else to make their money at that point. And it involved all sorts of characters like Norwegian generals and you know, eunuchs and oil men and all sorts of things. And it was, I thought it was a fairly interesting project. But for some of our challenges, some of them were small, like formatting books right to left in the Internet Archive, which we figured out eventually. 
some of them were a larger scale, like the scope of the projects kind of grew as the project went along. That was not unique to this project. But aside from that, one of the good things about this project is that it made ample use of the museum materials. We had all sorts of new digital, high quality digital photographs taken for this. You know, you could see these textiles in greater de detail than you can actually see in person. And we were able to host them for free or provide them for free online through Creative Commons licenses. And it's really, a, it's a wonderful extension of library and museum collections, bringing together some stuff that was in the special collections archives from Bass Warner's papers, bringing together the actual art pieces from the museum, expertise from the history departments, and all sorts of resources more than digital. So I was a big fan of that one. Sir Glenn Wally's project. Um, he was making this to accompany a site or a class he was teaching on the supernatural in Japanese culture. He's a professor of Japanese literature and culture in the East Asian language and literature department here. And one of the big things here was learning how to find what he wanted to talk about. So, you know, boxes have a particular significance here. Uh, you know, you need to be able to read what is actually happening in the picture. And so for this one, we might note, it's sort of a silly picture. You know, these guys are getting their hair done by these foxes or these mischievous creatures, but also representatives of the goddess Inari. And you see behind the, the bushes here, you have the Tory gates, which symbolizes uh, you know, the entrance to a temple or a shrine rather. And on the Tory gate, you actually see the Nosatsu posted. You see this, the, the votive slip too. And so it's this sort of self-referentiality that was so common in these slips that was part of what he was investigating was the subculture of the Nosatsu posters and the sort of nostalgia that they were invoking at a time of um, societal change in turn of the century Japan. But part of the, the challenge was just learning all of this and knowing what he was looking for. Aside from that, it was a lot of, you know, it was just time. It was actually sifting through, or in digital, sifting through the, the MIMSI collection of the JSMA. And it was entering all the data relevance to these onto a mecca and photoshopping the relevant slips neatly. Draghi Kowali's project, once again, challenge is categorizing and learning what to look for. Uh, I guess Franny has some more stuff. Um, but also, this is an unexpected challenge, it was just learning how to measure these things properly. Because you don't want to touch the paper when you're measuring. Some of these things are centuries old. You know, every good Takagami book starts with a quote from the Emperor Shomu and his wife, uh, I think, Komyo. And Emperor Shomu is from, I believe, the, the 8th century. Uh, common era. And it, it's a sort of chronological history of you know, who's who in Japanese Buddhism, who's who in uh, the world of Japanese politics. You know, the son of Oda Nobunaga is, is in this collection. And it's, it's a remarkable book, honestly. But it's also a, a fragile book. And that's one of the reasons why it doesn't get seen often and why digitizing it is so important. Because otherwise, people won't have access, they won't know this is even here. And so this project was really useful and that this is a wonderful resource that has been locked away in a special part of the special collections. And it's now gonna see the light of day. So that's exciting. Um, but challenges, measurements, categorizing, and tools, you know, you have your basic measuring tape, you have a, your Excel spreadsheets for the data you find, and you have a Mecca for display. The RS Wood, it's in progress. Um, but uh, I think you're getting a sense that research is always a constant challenge with these because you're having people coming from different areas, different fields, and uh, trying to assist professors coming from different areas and different fields with different priorities. But uh, Professor Yaris and Professor Wood also brought in a lot of their own students to help with research, so that was a smaller demand on our time. Um, the particular challenge here was recording podcasts and editing podcasts effectively. And 
you know, the challenges have shifted as we moved towards online um, editing. It's gone from in-person recording sessions to well received individual audio tracks from Professor Yars and Professor Wood and uh, mix those in audacity. But the basic challenge of editing an effective podcast remains the same. Um, one of the goals for this project though is not just it's not just a university project. They're hoping that by putting this on Spotify and talking about the sort of pivotal moment in mental health care, this sort of discussion of Morningside Hospital and the controversy of Alaska Natives in the mental health care system. But they can bring mental health care and this discussion of mental health care to a wider audience to try to remove some of the stigma surrounding it and to get people to think about how exactly our mental health care system worked in the past and how it works now. And so I think the Spotify podcast will be it will be a wonderful way to do that. So the Gallagher Project, um, you know, I talked a bit about the tasks for this one. And the challenge here is it's mostly a professor-led project, but it's um, mostly on designing effective online curricula, which is very relevant today. You know, making the best use of Canvas, making the best use of this online um, class management platform. It's like Blackboard or Moodle for other schools and using it to showcase what we have in the library to talk about curation in general and to use it to reach out to other institutions with a shared interest in curation and presentation. And so I think that this will also be you know, a, a project with a long lifespan after it's done. And here's just a finer, this is a quick discussion on one of the finer points of some of these projects. So one of the main display tools that we've been using has been Omeka. But another one was WordPress. And there's, I think there's a, you have something to say for either of these. But for WordPress, it's a flexible tool for the most part. It's fairly straightforward, it's easy to use. And we have an existing UO blogs domain that is very simple to use and can host all of these but it's also not perfect for some of these more intensive projects because it's not as, I say it's flexible, but it's also less complex. And so that you don't have as many options as you do with something like Omeka. And batch uploads are much easier on Omeka. But Omeka is also complicated because while it's a wonderful exhibition tool, you also, it's not quite as simple to learn as WordPress and we can't use our existing new blogs domains for it. And one of the problems that we have currently is that we had a coder um, on staff, not directly as part of the Mellon team, but the library had a coder on hand who helped us a lot with making modifications to our Omeka builds, but he found a different job. And so now we don't have anyone to help us make um, on the fly modifications. So it is something to consider if you wanna use Omeka. So just to crystallize and talk about challenges, in the early stages of all these projects, some of the recurring challenges were ensuring proper rights, um, reconciling different set data standards used for the JSMA and for the library, and for ensuring accessibility for all these resources for all site visitors. So this meant making sure that you know, optical recognition was working effectively on documents, so making sure that all videos were captioned properly, and making sure that we had dubs if needed. And so the second part that I want to talk about is more of a, I guess, wintertime challenges. And we're another recurring thing is project scope would often creep up by this point. You know, it was a large project to begin with, but now as the time draws thinner, the project seems to grow wider. And so there was a lot of work on the part of uh, Jenny and Ben, I think, to keep these projects reasonable and focused. Because, uh, you know, each professor wants to do so much with a project. It's a, and you can always add more to a big exhibition like this, but it's difficult to do that effectively with a limited amount of time. And uh, finally, for some springtime challenges, launch was always a bit messy. There would be unexpected technical um, uh, problems. There would be some difficulties with you know, just entering all the data or all data, it's a lot of data to enter. 
and just to make sure that everything looks good, feels good, and that everyone is happy with the way the project has turned out. Then after the fact, there has been some um, difficulties with promotion and maintenance. And so these are all things to consider in the afterlives of the projects. You know, it's not just like you take it down and it's gone. This is supposed to be a resource that people can come back to, hopefully, for quite a while into the future. But there's also a lot of positives. I think the positives really outweigh the negatives. There are any real negatives. You know, we're bringing together these different collections. We're bringing them together using new tools and teaching these tools to faculty and to graduate students. You know, I, I've learned a lot personally as part of this project. I know that the professors have also learned about what's possible at the university, what's possible with their own research and presentations. You know, it's also been good for um, connecting UO to a wider world of scholarship. It's not just the Northwest thing. People can look at these websites from all over the country and the world. And it's not just about, that was a history project. It's not just, oh, it's for the Honors College for a rhetoric, rhetoric class. It's about bringing together these different threads and these different themes and these different disciplines through these digital tools for a more holistic look at some of the unique resources we have on campus and making them publicly available. And I think we've been very successful. So I'd like to conclude with just a, bit, a couple of reviews, or not necessarily reviews, but some tips and discussion about what the project meant to different team members. So here we have uh, Ben Gillespie, who was our manager for this year. And he's talking a bit about what the role meant for him professionally. And so you know, it was a great role coming from a PhD program. Uh, it was a scholarly role, and it helped him develop um, project management skills and cross-institutional um, communication skills that I think will be a big boon for him and his new job at the Smithsonian. For Jenny, I'll move this out of the way so you can see. She had more advice for someone who was hoping to manage a project like the Mellon Initiative. And what she wanted to be clear about is that it's really important that everyone is clear on priorities and what's important, what absolutely needs to be done, and what you can do without. Because you'll need to do without something at some point. There will need to be compromises made. And there will never be competing priorities, as, he, as she says. And so that's her main piece of advice for anyone who wants to do a project like this. It's all about communication and uh, you know, having communicated your goals and expectations frankly and effectively. And as for us graduate students, I couldn't get in touch with Liam for this, but we have a bit of feedback from AXA. And she was saying, you know, it's been a very rewarding experience as an international student. And that it's also been helpful for her professional developments. Yeah, I, I feel, you know, I'm not an international student, but I feel the same way. It's been a great learning experience. I've learned new tools. I haven't been the project manager, but I've learned about project management, watching Jenny and working with Jenny and Ben. And I've had the chance to do original research and to work with professors doing all sorts of research in fields that I hadn't necessarily had contact with. And I found it you know, very intellectually and professionally rewarding about two years of my life. So I think that's about time for us. So I'd like to thank everyone for listening. And please let me know if you have any questions. Hi, Tom. This is Aaron Stoddard from the University of Oregon. If it's okay, I'll ask a question. Certainly. Hi, Aaron. 
Um, thank you so much for your presentation. I thought it was just wonderful to hear about all the different aspects to thinking about how these different projects are kind of worked on in libraries. I was wondering, um, from your perspective as a graduate student, you know, what was your favorite part of the project or kind of what do you think is something that you'll really take forward with you past, past when you're out of school? Certainly. So I think one of the things that I'm really going to take forward from this experience is having the opportunity to work as a team on one of these, you know, sort of uh, mixed projects. You know, there's always shifting responsibilities. There's lots of different tasks to be done. And there's a very compressed timeline to do all of these. And so I think the sort of, um, I think I've had to learn to prioritize tasks. I think I've had to learn how to research effectively and efficiently. I think I've had to learn a lot about uh, professional communication and uh, expectations throughout this time. And I think those are all things I'm going to be taking forward in uh, whatever I do in the future. That's great. Thank you so much. Are there any other questions? I think in that case, though, we, we might just uh, we might just conclude. So, uh, email me if you have any further questions. And thank you for your time. Thanks, thanks for coming out for this. I, I hope it was helpful. <laughs>